Okay, um, let's get resumed. Um, I hope you enjoy um, lunch. Um, well, uh, before um, starting um, and then uh, before introducing um, today's speaker of the lunch and keynote, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, two people who um, have um, contributed to um, SMU Tower Center as well as uh, um, um, Japan Society Dallas Fort Worth. Um, so first, um, we have a uh, um, leading journalist in Japan, um, Mr. Mikio Sugeno of uh, Nikkei, um, who is, uh, yeah, who is, uh, uh, so Sugeno-san um, has uh, uh, helped us um, for uh, Tower Center, but especially Tower Scholars program. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sugeno-san. Um, also, uh, we have a uh, um, director of uh, Texas Japan office, uh, Mr. Hiroyuki Watanabe. Um, Watanabe-san was a speaker, one of the speakers of the, this year's uh, Japan Society Dallas Fort Worth Japan Current Symposium. And we talked about uh, medium and small enterprises and uh, local development and a lot of economic growth. Um, and then um, it was a great conversation. There was a great conversation between Watanabe-san and Jason Galui for uh, how to um, achieve a lot of economic growth of the prosper Texas. So, and then by inviting the Japanese uh, medium small enterprises. So that was very um, interesting. Um, I'm delighted to uh, in, uh, introduce um, Ambassador Ron Kirk. Um, Thank you very much for flying in to uh, Tokyo. Um, and um, Ambassador Kirk tried to fly in yesterday, and then he will fly back to Dallas um, uh, tomorrow. Um, and uh, by the way, um, Dallas is a very uh, convenient place uh, to go from Tokyo. So uh, uh, please uh, visit us. Um, there are uh, three daily flights from Tokyo to Dallas, um, one by Japan Airlines, two by American Airlines. Um, Japan Airlines flight is from Haneda, so very convenient. Um, and uh, uh, American Airlines flight, one by, um, from, from Haneda, the other from uh, Narita. Um, when I went to, uh, um, well, when I said that uh, there is a three daily, uh, three flights, uh, from between uh, Tokyo and Dallas, um, some some of some people like uh, uh, Japanese people uh, said, "Oh, that's great! You know, there are like, three weekly flights. Um, no, <laughs> it's actually five, three flights a day. Um, so uh, it's a um, it's uh, very uh, convenient to uh, visit Dallas. So uh, oh, uh, if you have a chance to um, uh, to visit Dallas, uh, let me know. So we will." Um, we will uh, welcome you. Um, so uh, Ambassador Kirk uh, is, uh, uh, first of all, a former um, US trade representative uh, during the uh, uh, Obama administration. Also, uh, he is known to be, uh, I would say, the best mayor of Dallas. Uh, <laughs> well, um, a good thing is, uh, usually mayoral race uh, is not a partisan. So, um, and, um, and then we have had, I would say, I, we have had a very good mayors. So, um, uh, but you know, uh, Ambassador Kirk, um, at that time, a mayor Kirk, uh, is, uh, uh, has done the remarkable um, um, job and has made the remarkable achievements because he kind of overcame, he kind of overcame the kind of partisan divide, racial divide, and political divide. And uh, if you know, you can um, kind of make a consensus across the parties, across the um, political ideologies, and then that across the actually view on the globalization. So that's actually one of the achievements that uh, Ambassador Church made. Uh, and they made sure, I don't know, how to convince uh, every group of the people um, in uh, that uh, everybody could benefit uh, from uh, globalization. Uh, that's actually 
I, I knew that, uh, but uh, uh, when uh, I always um, had respected you, uh, and then I was, I was so happy when uh, I, I met you for the first time. So uh, I'm so, so uh, delighted uh, to have you today in the, um, for uh, this uh, opportunity, and then I could invite you to Japan. Um, so um, today, I, our format is uh, we I ask um, him some questions, let interview him, uh, but more like you know, I try to set this as a kind of, we, I, I really want to uh, talk with um, Ambassador Kirk over various issues, especially about trade issues, but uh, uh, various issues. So uh, I will um, talk with uh, Ambassador Kirk for, for um, 20 minutes or so, and then I'd open to the floor and the Q&A, and then um, Ambassador Kirk mainly uh, will answer the questions, but uh, if uh, accordingly, I will jump in. So, so first question I have is, this is I, I have been uh, working on um, trade politics for a long time, and then for a long time, like the trade politics, trade is a so boring topic in political science, right? So, and then it's so difficult to understand trade theory, like economic theory is so convoluted. Um, and then uh, our competitive advantage is so uh, counterintuitive, right? So, uh, uh, and then like, uh, um, and then I just, for last several years, for some reason, uh, it, became, uh, it became a very hot topic in politics. And then particularly, uh, interestingly, in the United States, uh, protectionism has been rising. Um, this actually is not necessarily a universal trend. For example, like, uh, Japan, like, uh, still like, uh, support for free trade is still like, uh, has a majority support. And then it doesn't like, uh, the support for trade is at least doesn't decrease, uh, if not increasing. But the US has a, a clear trend of the rising protectionism and the rising public support of uh, protectionism. So. Uh, my first question is like, why is protectionism, why has protectionism been rising in the United States? Well, first of all, thank you for that ridiculously generous, do I mean to, yeah. what am I doing? It's, uh, yes. How many ambassadors does it take to turn on the microphone? <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, uh, Takeuchi for the invitation to return to Japan, a place I've had the opportunity to visit for many years. Thank you all for uh, the chance to uh, address some of the issues that you heard a little bit referenced in the remarks last night by my good friend, longtime friend, Ambassador Schieffer and Diana. But I will start with at least your acknowledgement of my time as mayor. What I would hope he would remind you is I was blessed to be mayor, not my idea, but I was mayor that hosted the very first Sun and Star Festival, which was the largest exhibition at that time of Japanese art outside of Japan. And it was for over a period of three months in the summer. And that beginning of that relationship uh, not only helped cement the very strong ties between the business and cultural communities between Texas and Japan, but I think helped to give rise to the birth of the Tower Center and the work that they're doing in that. So this is kind of coming full circle for me. Secondly, as a mayor, one of the um, responsibilities, one of the, the joys I thought found of being the mayor of a large metropolitan uh, area like Dallas is export promotion. So we had a fairly, you know, crude, simplistic view of trade, but we very much saw trade as a next positive. And you heard Ambassador Schieffer mentioned last night in terms of trade in the United States, Texas is far and away the largest beneficiary, net beneficiary of U.S. government's trade policy. Part of that's because of the strength of NAFTA, our proximity to Mexico and Canada, but even with Japan, longtime companies like Texas Instruments, Mary Kay Cosmetics and others have been deeply aided, um, anchored in this part of the world. So I came to the job as US trade representative with a very positive view of how trade could uplift local economies attract foreign direct investment um, in Texas, and Tom, correct me, even today, 
we estimate something 25% of all jobs in the state of Texas are somehow related to trade. I would think that that number intuitively might even be a little bit higher in the Dallas-Fort Worth community. But as I took on the responsibilities uh, of our U.S. trade representative, when President Obama asked me to step into that job, I brought with me not only that strong sort of pro-trade um, positive agenda, but I also brought with me a very new and different view of trade because I married this fabulous, brilliant woman who grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. And not one, but all of my in-laws are either auto workers or steel workers or retired auto workers and steel workers who reminded me every day how correct they thought uh, one of our fellow Texans, Ross Perot, was when he famously said about NAFTA at the time that it was passed that that sucking sound that you would hear would be all of our, their jobs going to Mexico. Now, we got, I'm not going to steal race thunder because we're going to talk about NAFTA. But it helped me in a broader picture realize that as much as we believed in trade, there are winners and losers of trade. And, and unfortunately, um, in the United States, and it's not absolute, you can almost use the Mississippi River as a marginal line. States, if you think about it, states west of the Mississippi tend to be dominated by oil ex exports or agriculture or new technologies. These are the states that typically are on the plus side of the ledger, whether it's Texas or Washington or Montana or California up there, whereas many of the states east of the Mississippi, and I'm painting with a very broad brush, but certainly in that industrial Northeast, really felt aggrieved by trade. They believed that their jobs, those factories had been shipped to then Mexico, or whether it's now China or any place else. And we give enough statistics and studies to show that many of those factories were closed years before NAFTA went into effect, and it was more automation and others. But the reality is there is a very bifurcated country in the United States as we look at trade. The good thing, what I found from my time as U.S. Trade Representative, if you did not use the words free trade, you could engage and you can engage the American people on the benefits of our economic engagement with the world. They are frustrated. You see that same frustration borne out in Europe and other developed economies because we are sort of at the top of that, 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 that growth pyramid where families move from the farm to the town to the factory then send their kids to school, and then we become ent entrepreneurs. And there's an anxiety of what's next? You know, where are our kids going to work? So that's not just a, a U.S. phenomenon. But we are in a period of time in which there's a lot of anxiety over whether our openness to trade, our helping to rebuild Europe and Japan after World War II and other wars by opening up our economies, whether we have reaped the benefits of that. There is a belief that, yes, we get more innovation, we get cheaper laptops, we get better food, we get cheaper clothes, but the feelings that the trade-off has been we've shipped all our jobs somewhere else. And so what we are experiencing now is having to have a more honest assessment. And Diane, I think you mentioned that. It's been for too long we dismissed those people as anchored to an old mentality, but some of their concerns are real. And I don't think those of us that are pro-trade, that are trade uh, disciples, have had enough of an open ear to those that live on the other side of that marginal line to say, you do have legitimate concerns. We have not enforced our trade agreements. Many of our trading partners have not opened up their markets to us as freely, but these are all problems that are solvable. What's different now is that for years because of, and everything comes back to, and I forget, 
um, the gentleman who was on the panel talked about the reality of polling and getting public support. But the sad reality is the way our politics now play out in our presidential uh, elections. The Democratic primary, no matter what, we look at all of the elections and you still hear the pundits say, well, it's going to come down to Virginia, maybe Florida, you know, and then with, you know, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Those are the states most that feel most agreed by trade. So their voices tend to have a disproportionate weight, certainly in Democratic presidential primaries. But for the first time in 2016, we had a Republican candidate who ran for president on a very anti-trade, make America first agenda. And so that traditional coalition uh, of a majority, and again, I'm speaking in very broad terms, um, generally you could count on 70% plus of Republican elected officials to have a very pro-trade, pro-let's get access to newer markets, let's do more trade agreements, and maybe 20, 25% of Democrats that came from states like Texas and maybe now uh, Mississippi and Alabama that are home to all of the new auto industries that could vote for trade. For the first time, you didn't have anybody running for president on a external vision for our country. Everything became very internal. And we've got to work through that. Um, I try to have the same um, positivity. Uh, and I'm not picking on Diana, but Diana was saying at the end of all that her balloon felt like it was deflating and going. And Diana, you, you had a panel, you'll have to forgive me because you've had a panel full of academics. Now you just got a politician. And so, you know, the academics quote Churchill and de Tocqueville and being the sports fan that I am, uh, we're in baseball season right now. And one of the great documentaries that's out right now is on one of America's most, I think, under underappreciated philosophers uh, by the name of Yogi Berra. And there's a documentary on him. And so when you were asking, Jim, about the future, whether Jason was saying, I think that it was uh, uncertain, a diner's Yogi Berra future uh, simply said, as only he could, he could, the future ain't what it used to be. So that's kind of what it is about trade. But I, because of my experience, I still am hopeful we can make the case for that. But as Tom said, leadership really matters. Uh, you cannot have a president creating this very insular narrative or a belief that feeds into that legitimate fear and anxiety that many Americans have about our future and our economy, that our building up partnerships with the world, whether it's here in Southeast Asia or in Africa, other words, has to be a sum zero game. And I think we can make the case that it is a win-win proposition, uh, but we need leaders that are willing to do that. And right now we are just in a very fearful, uh, I think internal battle over what we want our country to be, what we want that to look like. And trade's just a part of that discussion. And finally, I would say one of the things I've learned from my experience as US trade rep, trade is thought of very differently um, in countries like Japan or Singapore or New Zealand, where trade is 90% of your economy, or, you know, as it is in Singapore and New Zealand, it may not be that here in Japan. In the United States, trade's a critical part of our economy, but it's 13%. So most Americans don't wake up every day unless you have a president telling them, oh, our deficit with China is you know, $400 billion. You know, most Americans are privileged enough to not wake up every day and think about the goods, the services, the products that we put on our table, the clothes we put on our kids' backs and where they come from and how it affects the global economy. But I, I know firsthand that if we are willing to sit down and have those conversations in a setting somewhat not that dissimilar, Jason, to what you said, where you walk through the benefits of it and what we can do from it, that we can change that narrative.
Well, in terms of the benefits and plus, and then the kind of discussion of deja vu uh, discussion, but it's still puzzling because um, uh, so because it's actually rising protectionism, so it's like a change. And then my question is why now? So uh, I usually teach um, international political economy class, and then. Um, when I teach politics of trade, I should trade benefits some people and then trade harm some people. And then that's actually inevitable. So um, it's not the trade benefits everybody. Um, and then that's actually true for, that's a, just a truism, right? And then now, so one of the major changes of last 20 years is uh, so-called the spread of global value chains. So um, it's not like kind of when to produce a one product, uh, it's the product is not produced in one factory, but uh, various factories. And then like uh, um, those factories are rotated in different countries. So, uh, and then when the parts move from one place to another uh, factory, and then if it is a, those two factories are rotated in different countries, then that there is international trade. This is actually a major trend of, um, uh, trade in the Asia Pacific. And then also US also is engaged in the trade based on global value chains. Now in this case, um, actually trade winners and losers of trade is a little bit more complex, but um, actually winners are more, com uh, more like uh, um, more straightforward in the sense that, uh, so if you invest in the country and then they like, produce the parts, then like, that will have a you know, positive impact on the economy. So uh, these, like, uh, more, I think like uh, global value chains make it easier for each country to realize the benefits of trade. And then now in the United States, uh, protectionism is rising. So why? I, I want to be careful and, and, and I don't want to sound defensive because you, you, you are right. But in the, broad, in the broader sense, the one common denominator that's run through all of these panels is China. And the change directionally of China economically, in terms of relations, in terms of security, and the reality that um, the principles on which just about all of us in this room welcomed China into the global trading world 20 years ago um, are very different today. I mean, we're, we are not dealing with economic reformers who want to keep a communist party. We're dealing with a much more nationalistic China-focused economy, and it is incumbent on the United States and Japan, as they have come together jointly to look at the agreement we made on semiconductors, for example, and chips and supplies, to recalibrate in light of the world in which we live in Today, I don't think that's protectionism. I think that is smart economic policy while still leaving um, the door open. But in the broader context of how this affects the political support um, for trade in the United States, the one thing that I do think I, I, that, that, that helped me in my role as U.S. trade representative, and I was asked this during my confirmation hearing by um, Senator Olympia Snow from Maine, one of the most thoughtful, bipartisan members and being very kind, not at all being pejorative. Um, but when I was going through my hearing, she was on the committee and she said, well, you know, we appreciate your enthusiasm, your support for NAFTA, but what in your background as a mayor do you think empowers you to step into this role as U.S. Trade Representative? And and as Tom knows, when you're being prepped to go through confirmation, you know, they just pile you with all the informations about FTAs and all that. And this was the one thing I hadn't thought about. And I thought about it for a minute. And I said, Senator, I think there's two things. I said, one is a sense of urgency. And I said, no disrespect to you, because I'm a child of the U.S. Senate. I served as an aide to Senator Lloyd Benson. I have great respect for this body. I said, but Senator... I noticed on your biography, one of the things you're most proud of is negotiation of a software lumber agreement between the U.S. and Canada. It took you 20 years. I said, if you're a mayor in America and you have a challenge and you don't get it solved, you don't have a job. 
in four years. The people that we represent can't sustain a 20-year beef, no pun intended, between Japan and the United States and the United States and Europe over the supply of beef. They're out of business. They're gone. And secondly, is understanding the needs, the fears of the people that we serve, not in an academic sense, but in a real sense. So in these conferences, we tend to use words like supply chain, rationalization, and benefits. And I remember I was on a panel like this uh, my first year as U.S. Um, trade representative for the Aspen Institute. And I was thinking, this is a pretty cool job. I get to talk to all these start people. Nobody told me after I did my little talk that they told me I would take questions and answers. And my interlocutor was Alan Greenspan. <laughs> and I was like, nobody told me this. And Alan Greenspan came. This is a true story. And he looked at me in his first question, since when did trade become about jobs and not about supply chains and rationalization? And I said, all due respect, Mr. Chairman, when our unemployment rate hit 14%. So even though supply chains are important, if we cannot recalibrate the benefits of trade to a level that the American public can understand how it benefits them and their family, they're going to close their ears. The good news, we can do that. And when I say we, those of us who benefit from trade have not done a good enough job of explaining to our workers, to our families, how they benefit. I'll give you one example. One of the things we tried to do that I came up with when I was trade rep is um, I had two daughters at the time, um, and my oldest was a sophomore at Columbia. My youngest was in high school. And once I told them what position I was going to inherit in the administration, they immediately went online. And But for the fact this is true, it would be more less painful. My oldest daughter came down uh, after dinner and said, you got the worst job in the cabinet. I thought the president was your friend. You said he liked you. Everybody hates trade, you know, because she'd gone online and shit. And by the way, your website sucks. And so, you know, me, even though I'd been nominated to be USTR, had never looked at our website. So I immediately went online and thought, she's right. So I empowered every young person on my staff. I heard the youngest person on our staff to redesign our website. And the second thing we did was try to put information on our site that anybody that logged on could log in to Dallas, Texas, to Omaha, Nebraska, to so-and-so Maine, and find a company in their city that was creating jobs because they were a supplier to General Motors, they were a supplier to Texas Instruments to be able to break down this notion that all the benefits went to the big guys. And so we went to companies like Boeing and Caterpillar and Ford and said, do your suppliers make their employees aware that the reason that they have a job is because we're selling airplanes to the UAE, that we're providing, you know, one of every three Caterpillar tractors is now being sold to Africa and what. And the reality was Many of our companies don't. And I sat on a factory floor in Boeing of all places and did a town hall meeting with the U, with the um, um, largest union that builds our aircraft. And when you're on Boeing's factory floor, Boeing paints the flag of the country that that plane's going to be delivered to. And on that factory floor, three quarters of the planes being built were being sold outside of the country. But yet when I sat down with the union, they read a position paper that came from, from their union in Washington that talked about why they were against trade. Now the ambassador and me would have shaked my head. The mayor and me spoke to them like a mayor and said, you gotta be blank and kidding me. You don't have a job if we're doing that. But anyway, long story short, we can both answer the challenge to rationalize our supply chain because of security reasons and others. But as we do that, we should do it in a way that we look at who all the beneficiaries of that are 
of that that decision up and down the fly chain to the supply chain that's how we begin to restore america's faith in the benefit of the tr of trade and we just have to talk to people in language they can understand i would start every talk to every group i did in the united states with one fact that americans now represent less than 5% of the world's consumers and there's not a business in america that believes you're going to be healthier playing the 5% of the population rather than the other 90%. And that the way we reach those other 90% of the consumers is having smart, thoughtful trade policy that reflects our values, protects our key intellectual and security interests, opens markets, has enforcement. And when you do that, I promise you, in every audience, they go, yeah, let's do that. We've been doing that. We just haven't explained that to the American people. And once we can do that in a quieter, less political tone, then I think we can begin to rebuild um, that coalition that allow us to re-engage with the world. So, so you now you mentioned about China, and then um, last um, so last December when um, you spoke at the. Um, commercial diplomacy conference that Jason organized. You said, um, so if you want to pass something in Washington, D.C., you should frame it as how beneficial for the United States and how harmful against China. Uh, it, it's crude, <laughs> but I am, we do live in a political world right now. Well, and so, so I'm not proud of it, but yeah. the only thing you will get 535 votes for in our United States Congress, if it's couched in the interest of us responding to, restraining, competing with China. And that is my one hope that will be the threat we need, whether it's to pass the end of, I, I won't even say it, I'm so angry that we pulled out of of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but whether we get back in TPP or past that framework, it will sadly have to be couched that this is part of our alliance with strong strategic partners like Japan and others in Southeast Asia as a block against China's overreach around the world. And not saying it's the right way to do it, but it's the only thing I think that would build the the coalition among Democrats and Republicans. So you take it out of the, what are we losing, but what are we controlling? How are we competing? How are we maintaining our economic independence? And China, um, and and um, it isn't all Donald Trump's fault. I mean, as Tom said last night, we have a very different leadership in China that we would be um, derelict in our duties as policymakers to believe we could wish that away. Uh, Japan fills it, Australia fills it, Singapore fills it, and I think we need to have a thoughtful coalition. And that's what makes, going back to your central question, that's what makes, I think, our partnership, um, our longtime strategic alliance with Japan may be more important now than it's ever been. Um, and so we need to strengthen um, and cement this relationship as just as um, um, Jason suggested, because I think it's going to be um, critical to our economic, defensive, strategic um, um, security in the next several years. It seems like uh, that like, uh, that turns away from um, economic logic, and then so uh, it will probably come with uh, uh, economic consequences. It, it, it's going to be, yeah. but um, but I also believe, I mean, that even though I, I, I strongly disagree directionally mm -hmm. uh, where China is taking their economy, but they're, 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 they're very thoughtful people and the, there will be consequences for them as well. And I think we have to be firm in our belief that we have to have open competitive markets. We can't have small businesses in the United States competing against state-run financed economies in China. They're, I'm not saying this is not going to be without pain, but if we can create the type of alliance that we envisioned in something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership that's now moved forward without us, that's a strong incentive 
for China to slowly begin to, to change their behavior because China is dependent on us for their markets as well. They're, this is, I, 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 our economies are too intertwined to believe that we're just going to decouple them and walk away from one another. But it's going to be a different relationship. And I think that the United States has a responsibility to rethink our approach to China and make sure that it is a much more thoughtful um, um, strategic competition, but always leaving room for places where we can work, where we can work together. Yeah, it is interesting. Uh, as a China specialist, um, I usually say like uh, Xi Jinping administration is currently giving the priority to uh, political logic over economic logic. And it seems like the same thing happens for US-China policy. <laughs> so that's, um, um, well, this topic, I, 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 you're, I you're, the, you're, the, forever, you're the economist. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so uh, I'd like to now um, open to the floor and then like, who wants to uh, kick off the discussion? Um, Raymond. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It's it's so great to hear your words of encouragement about, about trade and how we can move forward. And I think it's long overdue. And if we could spread your message to the rest of the country and countries, I think that'd be really great. I do have a question that I'm not to challenge you a bit, but you know, in 1941, one of the great economists of the 20th century, Paul Samuelson, wrote this paper called Protection and Real Wages, which said that there's going to be winners and losers from trade. And it's exactly the same thing you were saying. Why doesn't the United States just simply invest more in the workers who lose rather than trying to do all these other ways to kind of get around it or attack China or attack, you know, whoever else? I mean, why don't we do trade adjustment assistance much more effectively and thoroughly? Well, being the last U.S. trade representative who passed a, a trade adjustment assistance program, I think that's part of it. I think, you know, the sad thing, and, and to some degree, it is part of the challenge the, the previous panel was talking about, the power of social media now. You know, we have to speak in paragraphs and thoughts and sentences, and other people are just saying, you know, trade is bad, your jobs are going, China's good, everybody cheats. The reality is, going back to my very crude analysis of the 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 the, the, the country's approach to trade east and west of the Mississippi, ninety percent of those jobs lost in what we call you know the old industrial northeast have nothing to do with trade. They were lost because we because of automation, because we become more efficient. But it's a lot easier. If you're the CEO who hasn't invested in this country, who hasn't invested in modernizing to walk in the factory floor and go, well, you know, Ross Perot's right. You know, that damn NAFTA, those darn Chinese, you know, those Japanese are stealing our jobs. Then to go in and say, we didn't do what we should have done. So one, I think we need a more honest discussion with the American public. And we may be forced there now because of the hyper-focus on AI and what's it gonna mean for jobs. We need an honest discussion for those families that are sitting there saying, I hear all that, but I'm not an economist. I don't understand this. Just tell me where my kids are gonna work. So we need to look broader and not just make it a discussion about trade, but what does it mean to be an advanced economy that relies increasingly on new intellectual property, new innovation, you know, new levels of intelligence that we'd never envisioned. What does that mean for me? And I think if we can do that in that broader context and not just make it, you know, trade the default for that, we have a better chance to get people to move forward. But, you know, we have had, you know, presidents who have argued that we should be investing more money in the re-education of our workforce, making sure that we're educating our children for the economies of tomorrow. But sadly, we have a, a political fissure in Washington that almost facts don't matter. It just all comes down to, is it going to win or is it going to not? But that's why I think this conversation is so relevant 
because the one place America is still working are in our major metropolitan areas. I mean, we have 10 global economies right now called Chicago and New York and L.A. and Miami and Dallas and Houston and Los Angeles. And that's where the business and that's where the innovation is coming. I mean, it, it's not going to be easily solved, but the more that we can do it in these major economic zones where we have the opportunity to have a little less strident conversation, where you have the opportunity to show, no, we are great beneficiaries of our trade agreements in Florida, which is why you have all these ports. While the Port of Houston's the single largest beneficiary of us widening the Panama Canal and all of the jobs that flow up and down the West Coast, um, that's where we're going to have to to engage the people. And the other thing uh, is elect more thoughtful people. And again, I'm a mayor. You know, I've run, I've been elected. And, you know, when you asked if I think our future's bright, I tell people there can be no better definition of an optimist than a black Democrat in Texas who ran statewide. Now, that's either an optimist or a fool. But, you know, when people ask me how we change our tone in America, I never miss the opportunity to tell them stop voting for stupid people. This is not that hard. Stop voting for people who have told you that they refuse to even talk to somebody on the other side, or they think all Republicans are evil, all Democrats. You don't have to vote for them. I mean, our our country has 400 million people. There have to be at least 10 million really bright, thoughtful people. And, and the shame on all of us that, that, that it is a given that Donald Trump's going to be the, the nominee of the Republican Party. And shame on my party that that we don't have a more robust answer to what we're going to have on the Democratic side. But we can fix that. We just have to vote, make sure we, we do. I tend, my wife describes me as an equal opportunity protagonist. So I have to get that in on both sides. I'm sorry. I'll stop then. Let's just think for a moment that you have Catherine Ty's job. And... Um, you're back in the administration. You have to advise President Biden. Uh, what would you tell him about getting back into TPP? How how would we do that? I mean, how could you convince him? Well, and, and I will say this, and I love Joe. Well, I hate saying that because that's that nothing's worse than going, oh, I love Joe Biden. But um, Joe Biden um, is much less likely to stand up to labor on trade than Barack Obama was. Now, you know, people were afraid Obama was going to be so liberal. So that but Obama was more, you know, of a big thinker. He wasn't a creature in Washington. He and Joe Biden will tell you, he's, all of us know his story. He's from Scranton. He grew up with labor. He loves, and this is not a, a criticism of, he loves them. That is a much more critical part of his political base. And so when you look at our trade policy, when you read our trade policy agreement, it's worker centric, it is redefining, he means it. And he believes that. And in a world in which Donald Trump has teed it up and amplified for labor again, yeah, you've been screwed by both George Bush and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, who disappointed you and Bush. And now we've got that. It is a very different proposition. Um, I am proud of the fact that I hired Catherine Ty. Um, and she worked with us as an attorney. She's brilliant. She is a trade. She's much more of a trade specialist than I am. And the thing I love about the job, they're only, I think she's now the 18th or 19th U.S. trade rep. You all know the story. We're a pretty new agency. We all talk. So I want to be careful. I didn't do the one thing I cautioned her was that um, the world needs to know when you speak, you're speaking for the president and that they can't bypass you and just go to the secretary of state or the secretary of commerce. That that will, and two, you don't work for Congress anymore. I know you do. I know you spend a lot of time on the hill, but you now answer to the president. So to your question, I would make the argument to the president as fiercely as I could that our being absent 
and I know I'm going to sound like a, a, a broken record, an old guy who's still angry that somebody took my TPP ball and left me on the porch, that our being absent from this economic recalibration in Southeast Asia in particular is going to ultimately harm those workers that he cares about more than anything else that we cannot sit by on the sideline and let other countries reap the economic benefit of that. And that ultimately, the thing that he cares most about is going back and being able to say, here's how your life's going to be better. Here's where your kids are going to work, are going to be advanced by our being a part of this economic engine that we were largely the architects of. And we cannot, we just cannot sit on the sideline and think we're going to win. And I, I know I'm, I'm I'm not as thoughtful as you all in reading who, who wrote, but I'm good at imagery. And I told him, you know, this is the equivalent of in a NASCAR race. There's a reason pit stops are timed in terms of how quickly you can pull off, get your tires, get your gas and be, get back on the track. We can't sit on the sidelines for four years and then show up to Japan and go, oh, I know we walked away and we sort of left y'all in the lurch, but we're back. So rip up all these new alliances and start buying our beef, buying our, we have got to be in the game and we have got to reestablish that credibility, particularly among our longest term allies that we're not gonna, you know, cut and run at the first sign of trouble. Um, now that's not a message he might want to hear, but again, if you can make it and he's, you know, I tell people, you don't get to be president of the United States without having some, some intellectual capacity, including Trump. I mean, we can make fun of him, but Trump brilliantly understood what nobody else did, that the path to the presidency was that argument that we're going to make America great. I'm going to do something nobody else did. And my democratic friends get mad at me when I remind them that those same out of work steel workers and retired auto workers who bought into hope then bought into Donald Trump. They didn't see that much difference. Both of them were outsiders. Both of them told them that they could make their lives better. Both of them told them that they would be reformers. Um, and so back to your 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 point, Jim, I just think we just have to be smarter. We have to be more thoughtful. But I, I think Biden gets that. And we, to some degree, do a little too much hand-wringing. I've watched it in every administration. In particular, I find it always interesting. Republicans always say, oh, Democrats have no trade again. Joe, you know, Barack Obama has no trade stuff. Labor won't do it. And yet all of the trade agreements, the important trade agreements, have most part been passed under Democratic administrations. You look back at NAFTA, it was Bill Clinton. And you look, Barack Obama's the only president to pass three, three trade agreements and extended trade uh, adjustment assistance. We did it all in one year and one month and one night. So it can be done. And at the end of the day, my argument has always been the same. There's never the time to take a bad agreement to the American public. But if we get an agreement that we can legitimately go and make the case to the American public, it benefits our farmers, it benefits our exporters, benefits our workers. We can usually somehow find a way to pull together that coalition to help us move forward. But Biden knows that the clock's ticking. We cannot stay on the sideline. And I hate to say it, the one wild card we have right now are what's happening in Russia and what's happening in China and the almost unified response in Congress to anything that you can cast as sort of a counter to that. I think that's, I hate to say it, but that's the card that we might have to play to be able to move it forward. Uh, hello, uh, uh, Ambassador. Thank you so much for your excellent remarks. Uh, I'm Mikio Sugeno from Nikkei. I'm uh, uh, working as a uh, uh, senior uh, editorial writer. Thank you. And I was in uh, Washington, D.C. as a bureau chief uh, from 2018. So when uh, Trump began the crazy trade policy, you know, so and, uh, nobody knows about uh, the future of the, this uh, outcome of the, this, these policies. So, but the, there's one thing that a Biden administration inherited 
this policy, crazy policy, so to say, it's tariffs on China. So, um, well, so he can make the difference, so Biden administration, I mean, so to give up the tariffs on China to uh, maintain a kind of free trade. But it seems to me that in a, it goes, it may go the other side because opposite side, maybe. So, because we, we would find a new function of tariffs. So uh, at the time it was a weapon of the trade war or threatening or leverage to press them to uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, fix, fix the policies. And thirdly, as it's a really uh, recently, we may find a kind of a uh, tool for the retaliation of or to the uh, question of uh, the Chinese Chinese policy. So, uh, what is your thought on tariffs and the tariffs of future? And then this is a very important question because um, we have to find a good balance between the free trade and economic security. So the, please, please uh, thank you so much. At the end of the day, I always gonna lead with my belief that tariffs ultimately are a tax on our own citizens because we pay them, even though, you know, Mexico's not paying for the wall, China's not paying these tariffs, they're being borne by the American citizens and others. So I generally am, am fiercely opposed to using those except for in extraordinary circumstances. And not much about the Trump trade policy. I think you heard from all of us in the room that we are, are, are agreed on. But he was right. I would I will say this. He questioned the efficacy of our approach to China over the last 20 years and whether we ignored the fact that China was not fully complying with the commitments that it made when it asked to be admitted into the WTO. Now, I think that's been, now I think they were making great progress. I'm not saying it was perfect. It was a relationship in which we were both uh, benefiting from, but there's no question that under the current administration, they have made a U-turn, if not a complete stop in that. So um, I think the way the terrorists were levied were sophomore, if not in compliance. But having said that, having inherited it with China's lack of compliance, even with, you know, what they agreed to, uh, it makes it very difficult in this current political environment for any president, whether it was um, um, Joe Biden or a Republican president, to come in and release and remove those tariffs. Secondly, once you have them, and I can give you a million cases where I tried to make the argument that tariffs didn't make sense. There still is this largest sense. What are we going to get for? I mean, we've had tar the American footwear industry has made an argument for 20 years that the biggest tax on middle, low income Americans is the tax we put on footwear. 90% of which, and when I say footwear, think of tennis shoes, think of Nike and that. All the tennis shoes are either made in China or now Vietnam. We have this heavy tax on them. They're not putting anybody out of business. They disproportionately hurt working class, family, single moms. But still, there's this sense, well, if we remove them, what are we going to get from them? So the reality is the tariffs are, are, are going to be here for a while. Uh, I am... You know, I want to be encouraged that at least we are having conversations uh, with China. But when you look at all of the behavior, more muscular we've seen, both in terms of just the last several days, in terms of military and others, it's hard for me to envision a scenario where those tariffs are going to be lessened. To me, the more thoughtful approach is we have to re-engage with our historic allies like Japan to build an economic wall, if not an economic wall, but at least build an economic lines to sort of overcome that pain. I do think um, with COVID, we were forced for the first time to look at the economic cost of 
having so much of our critical supplies made outside the United States, whether that's protectionism, whether that's thoughtful. I think you're going to see a number of countries begin to examine that. But we had enough um, conversation about supply chain. So I think in that broader context, what we're doing with Japan, re-examining the partnership we've made to re-examine everything from forced labor to looking at what we can do in terms of cooperation on electrification and batteries and supply chains is all going to be a part of that response. I would like to take one more question. Anybody? Um, Kiri? Oh, it's better to for um, interpretation. So it's great that we're having these conversations in this room with a bunch of professors and you know executives and impressive people, but the people who don't believe trade is a good thing aren't here. And there's not, unfortunately, a thousand ambassador Kirks to go around the country and explain that to them. So what's the best way to disseminate that narrative that trade is the best thing for the country, the most effective way to people who aren't in this room for these questions and answers? Well, thank you. One, I'm hopeful your generation can help do that. And just as social media is sort of this demon we have to fight, it is a remarkably efficient tool to get out information. Um, I wish I had kept it. Um, I think my favorite editorial of my four-year tenure um, as U.S. trade rep was a Wall Street Journal um, editorial op-ed that they did on America's do-nothing trade representative. And they criticized me because my second year in office, I pulled my entire staff together and said, we're going to travel the world. We've been around. We're going to, I promised you, you'd all get your passport stamped. I'm going to go where you tell me I need to be. But our problems are not in Korea, in Panama, in Colombia. Our problems are in Detroit. Our problems are in Pittsburgh and they're in Maine. And so I made a commitment uh, that for every, you know, how many months I spent out of the country, that I would go to those places, principally west of the Mississippi. And I did it. And I challenged members of Congress, Democrats in particular, who screamed at me about what a fool I was to go with me in their districts. So I went with Mike Michelle to Maine. Uh, and you don't know what it's like to show up in a place where everybody pickets me, but then they all come to the to the town hall meeting uh, and want my picture and my autograph. So look, it, it can be done, and it may sound up, but we just have to sit. But the other important thing is listen to them. They have been heard. They do feel agreed. But when you can sit down with people in Detroit and say, you do realize that we do a billion and a half dollars of trade every day with Canada. Most of it comes across your bridge right here in Detroit. That's not bad for you. They get it, but they want to hear. And I would say, and I'm not saying it's a panacea to everything, our enforcement efforts had not been what they had been. So having a fuller policy in which we don't just lead with trade, but you've always got to lead with jobs, you lead with fairness, the pub, American public gets it. We want to compete. We I mean, and I, I hope it doesn't sound too too uh, pejorative, but Americans do believe made in America is still the most treasured brand in the world. Brand in the world. We believe if we can have a fair competition, we're willing to accept our losses. But we don't believe that we've had open access to many of these markets, and we have not. And so I think speaking that plainly. Speaking that plainly, making it directional, not making it, you know, esoteric, that this is how we'll create the jobs to keep the factories open that are going to create the opportunities. And that we shouldn't fear that. And that the world is looking particularly for, I hate to say it, an alternative to China. I mean, we were dragged into the TPP. You know, our our partners in the re we were dragged, that we were welcomed into it so that this would not be uh, a region that was wholly dependent on a muscular China. Uh, and so I think if we can do that, we can speak honestly, we can recognize people's concerns, tell them how we're going to address that. Uh, we have an opportunity 
to re-engage the win. I will tell you one thing I forbade my staff. I would not allow them to ever use the word free trade because we have lost that battle. You walk into a room of Americans and tell them you want to talk about free trade and you're gone because they believe you've lost it. But if you tell them we're going to open markets, we're going to sell more of what we grow, what we produce, what we create to all these new consumers around the world who want to buy a more American, we're going to protect our intellectual property. We're going to enforce our agreements. We're going to hold our trading partners feet to the fire. I promise you their heads start going up and down. They go, yeah, we can do that. And we can. Great. Um, well, uh, we, we could com um, continue forever, but uh, um, we have to close now. Um, but before closing, uh, I'd like to um, join me for, um, uh, so I'd like to acknowledge um, simultaneous interpreters um, because usually they ask us to uh, give them some like um, material uh, and therefore preparation. Uh, but I insisted that I really wanted to chat with you. <laughs> so uh, I didn't give them uh, any uh, uh, information because we didn't know uh, uh, what we will, um, we will talk about. So. Uh, uh, please join me for applause for Simon interpreters. And also, um, so thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, discussion and conversations. And uh, please join me for uh, thank, thank you, you. Ambassador Turk.